Welcome to Sunday Worship at St. Matthew's Cathedral. I'm so glad you've joined us. Let us begin together. Alleluia! Christ is risen! The Lord is risen indeed. Alleluia! Almighty God, to all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Christ our Lord. from the Acts of the Apostles. Peter addressed the people, You Israelites, why do you wonder at this, or why do you stare at us as though by your own power or piety we had made him walk? The God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob, the God of our ancestors, has glorified his servant Jesus, whom you handed over and rejected in the presence of Pilate, though he had decided to release him. But you rejected the Holy and Righteous One, and asked to have a murderer given to you, and you killed the author of life, whom God raised from the dead. To this we are witnesses. And by faith in his name, his name itself has made this man strong, whom you see and know, and the faith that is through Jesus has given him this perfect health in the presence of all of you. And now, friends, I know that you acted in ignorance, as did also your rulers, in this way, God fulfilled what he had foretold through all the prophets, that his Messiah would suffer. Repent, therefore, and turn to God, so that your sins may be wiped out. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us read in unison Psalm 4, found on page 587 of the Book of Common Prayer. Answer me when I call, O God. Defender of my cause, you set me free when I am hard pressed. Have mercy on me and hear my prayer. You mortals, how long will you dishonor my glory? How long will you worship dumb idols and run after false gods? Know that the Lord does wonders for the faithful. When I call upon the Lord, he will hear me. Tremble then and do not sin. 
Speak to your heart in silence upon your bed. Offer the appointed sacrifices and put your trust in the Lord. Many are saying, Oh, that we might see better times. Lift up the light of your countenance upon us, O Lord. You have put gladness in my heart more than when grain and wine and oil increase. I lie down in peace. At once I fall asleep. For only you, Lord, make me dwell in safety. A reading from the first letter of John. See what love the Father has given us, that we should be called children of God, and that is what we are. The reason the world does not know us is that it did not know him. Beloved, we are God's children now. What we will be has not yet been revealed. What we do know is this. When he is revealed, we will be like him, for we will see him as he is. And all who have this hope in him purify themselves, just as he is pure. Everyone who commits sin is guilty of lawlessness. Sin is lawlessness. You know that he was revealed to take away sins, and in him there is no sin. No one who abides in him sins. No one who sins has either seen him or known him. Little children, let no one deceive you. Everyone who does what is right is righteous, just as he is righteous. The word of the Lord. Thanks be God. The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to Luke. Glory to you, Lord Christ. Jesus himself stood among the disciples and said to them, Peace be with you. They were startled and terrified and thought that they were seeing a ghost. He said to them, Why are you frightened? And why do doubts arise in your hearts? Look at my hands and my feet and see that it is I myself. Touch me and see. For a ghost does not have flesh and bones as you see that I have. And when he had said this, he showed them his hands and his feet. While in their joy they were disbelieving and still wondering, he said to them, Have you anything here to eat? They gave him a piece of broiled fish, and he took it and ate it in their presence. Then he said to them, These are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you that everything written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms must be fulfilled. Then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures, and he said to them, Thus it is written that the Messiah is to suffer and to rise from the dead on the third day, and that repentance and forgiveness of sins is to be proclaimed in his name to all nations, beginning from Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Christ. In their joy, they were disbelieving and still wondering. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Please be seated. On September 20th, 1977, 30 million television viewers were treated to an iconic moment of television drama. It was a Happy Days episode entitled Hollywood Part 3. I think there was actually a better than even chance that I would watch it at the time, our family being a Happy Days kind of viewing family. I was almost seven years old at the time. It's, just a, it's like I'm rubbing it in on some of you there. And in Hollywood Part 3, the Cunningham clan makes a journey from Middle America to Los Angeles, and hijinks ensue. Ultimately, while at the beach, Fonzie gets into a water skiing contest in a dare in which he proposes to jump over a shark enclosure that just happens to be right there at that beach. It's a surreal combination of the kookiest elements of sitcoms and James Bond movies all at one. 
and it was in a cliffhanger from Hollywood Part 2. That is, uh, they ended this prior season on, you know, ooh, Fonzie's going to get on, he's putting on his skis, and he's getting in the water. Then they come back next season with Part 3, and he's, you know, kind of going around, and, and the tension mounts. Our one character after another exclaims, he's really going to do it. I can't believe he's really going to do it. And finally, Joni says, I can't watch. Fonzie jumps the shark. And once Fonzie did that, millions of viewers decided with Joni, not only that they couldn't watch, but they were never going to watch again. Because jumping the shark became a catchphrase for a drama that loses its narrative coherence by placing its characters in an utterly ridiculous situation that only a gimmick, which breaks, which completely breaks the, the rules of the world in which the story is told, in order to resolve the plot and move it forward. It's, it's entered into the popular lexicon now, when a TV show or a series <coughs> excuse me, jumps the shark, it's just like, it's the point at which the audience says, oh, come on, and they, they quit watching, right? So in a sense, the, uh, the, the writers have run out of ideas, and they simply have to go start going for the ridiculous. Now, has that, let me tell you what, when Star Trek jumped the shark for me, okay? So, like, I was a Trekker as a kid, you know? I love Star Trek, you know, and the whole thing from the original. Yeah, I watched it in the original, right? So I am old enough to do that. So I did watch it when it was on TV at first. Until... Star Trek V, the movie Star Trek V, <clears throat> excuse me, where the crew of the Enterprise with Kirk and Spock and everybody else find, you know, they hear of this, of this being from this, uh, basically you have kind of a hippie movement starts on a planet, and it's a movement where they want to go back to Eden. So the Enterprise literally goes on a search for Eden where they find, <laughs> it's just so, anyway, it's just, yeah, it's so ridiculous, I can't even get through this. They find a being, which is basically a parody of what atheists think Christians believe God is, and then they manage to blow God up with photon torpedoes. <laughs> and it's like, you know, that, that for me, it's like, okay, this whole thing has jumped the shark, I'm done. I'm done. I was willing to go with Spock coming back from the dead, you know, and search for Spock. I was willing to go with that because, well, I, I'm a Christian, and more on that later. But, but you know, trying to blowing up God with your photon torpedoes. No, I just couldn't do it. Couldn't get into the series anymore. I could multiply examples, shows like the X Files and everything, where again, you know, you just get into a situation where it's like, oh, I just can't follow this anymore. As far as the disciples were concerned, Jesus' crucifixion, a crucified, suffering, dying Messiah, was threatening to jump the shark. It's almost like Peter takes, when Jesus, Peter takes Jesus aside and says, Lord, this must never happen to you. Like, this is just, I couldn't, you know, I can't go with you on this. This is just, that's just crazy talk. Right? That's utterly ridiculous. And... According to the Passion narratives, the viewership went down considerably from Gethsemane forward. Right? This is simply not how the story is supposed to go. You just don't come back from crucifixions. This simply can't happen. I just can't follow you anymore. It's ridiculous. Now, we are not too far removed from the disciples even in our modernity, though we see Jesus jumping the shark for different reasons. You see, we moderns are embarrassed not by death, not by horrific suffering or state-sponsored torture. We find that all too easy to believe. Rather, we, as moderns, are embarrassed by the miraculous because we seem to think that nature, by which we mean the physical world that operates according to mathematical laws that we deduce about it, 
We think that nature is telling us a story that is both morally neutral, that is, our interpretation of, we think our interpretation of nature is value neutral. It's not trying, it doesn't have a political program in and of itself. And that the story that nature tells is final. When your heart stops beating, that's the end, right? End of the story. You come to the end of the book at that point. Now, nature might tell the story of God's grandeur of perfection, a well-ordered system of inputs and outputs that we are called to master and make pay. And we are so convinced of the absolutism of this storyline that we are by turns perplexed, embarrassed, or repulsed by acts of God, be they hurricanes, tsunamis, or resurrections. We just don't like anything that tends to upset the apple cart in terms of our relationship with what we see as the objective natural world. I still remember after the big tsunami in Indonesia, you know, Larry King on his program on CNN trying to grill Rick Warren about the tsunami. Like, it's his fault. It's kind of like, so tell me, why does it, you know, essentially what it boils down to is tell me why this God you believe in allows tsunamis to happen. Right? And putting Christians on the hook for things that disrupt the natural order, as if Christians are the ones that are trying to tell a story that, you know, the natural world is, you know, perfect and, you know, and that, you know, that everything is moving along as it is supposed to be. That is not actually our narrative that we are supposed to tell. We as moderns simply can't go along with violating the rules of nature. And the resurrection is perhaps the prime violation of the story that nature seems to tell us. Also, as nature worshippers in this sense, not in the sense of the pagan world in which Jesus lived, but in the world in which we think that nature or the material world is the, has the final say and is telling us a story that is objective, we also believe in the stories that the power based, that those who base their power on nature's story and what they tell us about death having the last word seems like the most natural way for all stories to end. But Easter, in this framework, with our attitudes about nature, Easter is as if God can't tell the story right. How did he let this character in the drama get in such a jam in the first place? I mean, why didn't Jesus just kind of multiply bread? Why didn't Jesus just assume power? Why didn't Jesus follow through on his threat to call down legions of angels? I'll meet your legions, Rome, and I've got legions of angels. It's like, you know, Jesus could have told Rome that they were bringing a knife to an angel fight. I mean, you know, why didn't God do it that way? Can he not get his story right? God got his plot in such a jam that he has to use a gimmick or something that totally undermines what we think the rules of the universe are supposed to be to make it come out all right. So when Jesus goes into the upper room on the evening of his resurrection, he must, quote, open their minds to understand the scriptures. And along with opening their minds, Jesus has to open our minds too. In other words, Jesus begins to explain over the next 40 days, because sometimes that's how long it takes, that this is what the story has always been about. It's like, you know, if you come into something like, you know, now I didn't watch Game of Thrones because I'm not old enough, 
my mother did not give me permission to watch Game of Thrones. But it's as if, but my, from what I understand about the show, like if you came in in like season five, you have no idea. What, you know, no idea what's going on. And in a sense, Jesus has to sit down with the disciples and go through the Old Testament again to say, you guys missed seasons one through four. Or at least you didn't read them right. You weren't listening to the story. Resurrection, death to life power, the victory of love has been what the story has always been about. From the creation, to the giving of the law, to the prophets, to the Psalms, to Jesus' death on a cross, and to his new and eternal life in which he is sitting with them eating broiled fish right in the present. From Abraham to Exodus to the exile, the story has always been about the extreme, the infinite lengths to which our loving God will go to reclaim us from death and restore us to our true love and our true home with him. And in that light, in that light, as long as we're talking about narratives that jump the shark, we, we are the ones who jump the shark when we go to our own ridiculous lengths to get ourselves out of our jams to make the story come out right as far as we're concerned. That is to say, to make our stories come out without suffering being involved. To make, to tell the story of our life without death being a part of it. And human beings go through all kinds of gymnastic narrative somersaults and all kinds of behaviors to try to get out of the inevitability of telling a story that is meaningful about our lives that doesn't have suffering or death as a part of it. You can think of all the Think of all the things that you might think of as sins as human beings jumping the shark, trying to tell the story of their lives and getting themselves into such a jam that they have to do something simply ridiculous to try to cover up the fact that they've lost the thread of the narrative. We go to all kinds of extreme lengths to tell our story without trusting in God, without surrendering ourselves to the glorious new life that is God's desired destiny for us. In light of God's victory in Jesus, our sins are, can be seen as less evil than banal. One could imagine God having an eye roll. Oh, me have mercy. Watching human beings do the things they do. I'd better bless their heart. Think of Peter's speech, which we read this morning. Peter says, you acted in ignorance. And this has been kind of the classic Christian approach to a world that needs to hear the good news that you basically were idiots. You were acting so foolishly that in a sense, this is how things turn out when you do those sorts of things. But the good news is that in Jesus, God has intervened in all of your messed up storytelling to make all of your stories come out right in the end. In light of the narrative of the risen Jesus, our lives only make sense when we trust them, when we hand them over, as Paul would say in the 8th chapter of Romans, when we yield them, when we surrender them to God's death-to-life power. This power is testified, negative to, is testified to negatively in the Psalms, basically, which cry out, God, if you don't do something really soon, 
<laughs> this isn't going to turn out well. If you don't do something really soon, the story is going to be something that is not in your character. That's one of the, you know, the cries of the Psalms, like, God, we know who you are, and what's happening right now is not who we know you are. So, come on in and fix it. Come on in and fix us. Come on in and intervene on behalf of your dying people. It's testified to positively in the Acts of the Apostles, in the very miracle that is reported in Acts, in the story that we had the back end of this time and the front end of last Sunday, causing a man, a beggar, at the beautiful gate to walk and enter into the temple, into God's presence with the people of God. And people saying, who's that? That's not how blind, that's not how crippled stories are supposed to wind up, right? That's not what's supposed to happen to beggars. We know how their stories end in this natural world in which we live. What's going on here? And it's testified to in the lives of the saints, especially the martyrs, those who are most unafraid to tell a story to the world through their own lives about the victory of suffering love. God asks us to repent, to truly change, to face into suffering love, to accept the consequences of our own brokenness and then hand them over to God to be healed. And God asking us to do that may make our lives seem unbelievable or incoherent to us. Why would God ask me to do that? We can ask in our 3 a.m. moments, even when they happen in the middle of the day. Why would God do this to me? Why would God want this for me? But if, even while we are still wondering, as the disciples were in the upper room, even if we are still wondering how God's love can change our train wrecks and losses into hallelujahs, we can trust in God's power working in us more than we can ask or imagine. And our lives, instead of jumping the shark, can become a part of the greatest and most joyful story ever told. Amen. Please rise. Loving one another, let us with one mind confess the Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, one in essence and undivided. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things are made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven. By the power of the Holy Spirit, he became incarnate from the Virgin Mary, and then was made man. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son. With the Father and the Son, he is worshipped and glorified. He is spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. 
we look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. The prayers of the people, Form 4, are found on page 388 in the Book of Common Prayer. Let us pray for the church and for the world. Grant, Almighty God, that all who confess your name may be united in your truth, live together in your love, and reveal your glory in the world. Lord, in your mercy, Hear our prayer. guide the people of this land and of all the nations in the ways of justice and peace that we may honor one another and serve the common good. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Give us all a reverence for the earth as your own creation, that we may use its resources rightly in the service of others and to your honor and glory. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Bless all whose lives are closely linked with ours, and grant that we may serve Christ in them and love one another as he loves us. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. comfort and heal all those who suffer in body, mind, or spirit. Give them courage and hope in their troubles, and bring them the joy of your salvation. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. protect our frontline medical workers, first responders, and teachers, and grant us wisdom and perseverance to do what is necessary to defeat the coronavirus pandemic. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. in the midst of unspeakable acts of violence that we fallen human beings commit against one another, Help us to keep our trust in you and in our hope that one day in your new creation, all those redeemed in the resurrection of your Son will serve you in perfect harmony and eternal peace around your heavenly throne. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We commend to your mercy all who have died, that your will for them may be fulfilled. And we pray that we may share with all your saints in your eternal kingdom. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Almighty and eternal God, so draw our hearts to thee, so guide our minds, so fill our imaginations, so control our wills, that we may be wholly thine, utterly dedicated unto thee, and that use us, we pray thee, as thou wilt, and always to thy glory and the welfare of thy people, through our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Let us confess our sins against God and our neighbor. Most merciful God, we confess, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done, and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry, and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us, that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, have mercy upon you, pardon and deliver you from all your sins. Confirm and strengthen you in all goodness, and bring you to everlasting life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. The peace of the Lord be always with you. And also with you. I invite you to safely exchange God's peace with your neighbor. seated. Well, welcome again to St. Matthew's Cathedral. I'm so glad you're worshiping with us today, either in person or online. 
And speaking of worshiping in person, uh, that uh, now that I am, uh, you know, fully protected, I've kind of got my immunity badge, vaccines packs, um, and uh, I can now, um, I'm now permitted by the bishop to uh, give communion, the sacrament, uh, directly into people's hands. You know, I'm mass, you're mass, but uh, we'll have the uh, direct administration of the sacrament. And uh, next week, starting next week, uh, in our indoor service here at 8 a.m., we'll be uh, permitted to, uh, to sing and be three feet distant from other you know, biomes, if you will. So, uh, and in other words, we'll be able to go to every other pew in the cathedral, and uh, you'll be able to, you know, kind of uh, share a pew for, you know, as long as you're not like a family of six or something. And uh, so we can be working our way towards more capacity in the cathedral, and again, we'll be able to have the congregation join in the singing of our hymns um, and service music, which will be a, a good thing to which, for which we have longed uh, for a long season. And uh, this evening at 4 p.m., we'll be uh, celebrating uh, Anglican Even Song. So I invite you to join us outdoors um, for that uh, beautiful expression of prayer and scripture reading and song, and uh, so that you would join us uh, in that. And there are changes afoot for worship in May, which we'll get to when the time comes. Uh, but uh, for now, we rejoice in the changes in worship that will be coming just next Sunday. So 8 a.m., Mass on the Grass at 10.30 is there as, as uh, can, going forward. So uh, you can join us in that uh, worship as well. This is the day that the Lord hath made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Oh, mm -hmm. 
despised and rejected and nailed to the wood. You saved all the others, but you can't save yourself. We don't
And through the prophets, you taught us to hope for salvation. Father, you loved the world so much that in the fullness of time, you sent your only Son to be our Savior. Incarnate by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, he lived as one of us, yet without sin. To the poor, he proclaimed the good news of salvation, to prisoners freedom, to the sorrowful joy. To fulfill your purpose, he gave himself up to death, and rising from the grave, destroyed death and made the whole creation new. And that we might live no longer for ourselves, but for him who died and rose for us, he sent the Holy Spirit, his own first gift for those who believe to complete his work in the world, and to bring to fulfillment the sanctification of all. When the hour had come for him to be glorified by you as Heavenly Father, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. And supper with them he took bread. And when he had given thanks to you, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. After supper, he took the cup of wine. And when he had given thanks, he gave it to them and said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this for the remembrance of me. Father, we now celebrate this memorial of our redemption, recalling Christ's death and his descent among the dead proclaiming his resurrection and ascension to your right hand, awaiting his coming in glory, and offering to you from the gifts you have given us this bread and this cup. We praise you and we bless you.
gifts of God for the people of God. Take them in remembrance that Christ died for you, and feed on him in your hearts by faith with thanksgiving.
Yeah.